submitted as of Monday. Uh, we're rocking ahead, and we have um, two people here who have a very good experience with the program. We have Mary Leo and Carol Yop, and uh, we're hoping that they can kind of give some of their experiences with the program and hope this will become a little bit of a conversation as everyone's unmuted. Feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Um, they're going to talk about their experiences with the program going through, with their closings, and at the end, if anyone would like, we'll, uh, we'll do a little tech training on the website, which is the background you see here. So um, if we want to get started here, Carol, do you want to take it? Sure. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> well, hey, as... Carol? Yes? I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Jack, I think you're, um, you mute your computer. It is a little bit of an echo. Sure. Thank you. Sorry, Carol. It's all yours. Not a problem. Um, as Jack said, we've had very good success with the MAPS program so far. Um, we had the first closing on Long Island, and it's very uncomplicated. And it was a pleasure working, honestly, with everybody. We had a little bit of a glitch in the beginning, only because um, I wasn't following the directions properly. But it, after I got the guidance from Jackie and uh, Caitlin and everyone over at CNYCN, it went pretty much smoothly after that. Uh, I think the key to uh, being successful with the application process is to first have all your documents in place and uh, as much as you would expect that would be needed to render a decision. Um, and it's really nothing more than the tax bill and the um, mortgage statement that is to be included into the package then we would normally send for a modification review. Um, it is the key to having a complete package and to go you know forward pretty seamlessly the we're not on um, hope loan port but from what I understand it's not that unlike making a submission through hope hope loan port if anyone has the access and has used that successfully I don't think that the um, map program is any more complicated than that. The only hitch that could be a problem is having those homeowners that are not familiar with uh, the computer. But there's also the workaround for that, that we can do the application for the homeowner online and give them the opportunity to answer all the questions by getting all the information up front. And then you could just go on and create the application for the homeowner. So it's a uh, pretty easy process. Communicating with the people over at CNYCN has also been going fine through the actions and the communication log. And uploading the files hasn't presented any problem. And checking the status on where the application is hasn't been a problem either. So unless somebody has a specific question, it's, um, I, I would recommend it highly. We had the first closing in New York, and Caitlin came out and did it right in our office, and it went quickly, and the homeowner was thrilled with the outcome, and um, it resolved her issues very fast. We, we, I think it took from application to closing maybe 20 days. And that was the beginning ones, which I know that that's unusual at this point because there's so many applications across the state. But being the first one and to go so easily through the system, it's been, um, it seems to work great. I don't know if there's anything else that you want me to speak to that um, I left out. No, I think that was great, Carol. Um, how many days did you say it took? Uh, there's a little bit of well, our first you one. That. Our first closing only took about 20 days from application to um, closing. Great. And, yeah, uh, and it was funded shortly after. So um, it, it was really, I think, 
it, it couldn't have, it couldn't have gone any better. Great. Does anyone have any questions about what Carol just said? <laughs> Okay, well, Mary, do you want to talk about your experience with the MAP program so far? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I'm here with Trisha Eisenman, one of our counselors who's actually probably submitted the most MAP applications, uh, okay. from what I know, and had a we had a closing already. Pretty I similar to um, the experience you just heard, we think that MAP uh, applications are much more straightforward and easier to submit than the Hope Loan Port. Um, I would agree that the key is uh, having a complete application ready to go. In our office, we uh, gather up all of our ideas of who we think would be a good fit for MAP, um, and then I disseminate the codes as the applications are complete. So that kind of helps um, our pipeline from getting too clogged up. I won't give a, a passcode out to a counselor until we have a complete application. And then from there, I don't have too much uh, to add or, or to supplement to what was previously stated, it's really straightforward. Um, we've had success with it, and we've had two closings so far, and we did ours remotely. We're up in Rochester, New York, so we're just on the phone for a little bit longer than probably what it would take face-to-face, -face, but we didn't experience any issues. Trisha, do you want to add anything to that, because you've been the one doing them? Um, I think you pretty much summed it up, but... I, I've done two closings so far. We've done them on the phone with Kate, Caitlin, and um, everything's gone pretty smooth. Um, just explaining the whole program to the homeowner and how everything works uh, with the loan, but um, I think everything's been smooth. I have another closing next week, and I have like three or four more applications waiting. So. <laughs> We're very fond of the program here and very fond of Caitlin. She's been a tremendous help, and no matter how many annoying emails I send to her about my little mistakes or I need more codes or whatever it is, she's been real helpful, so we appreciate that up here. I agree. We've had the same experience, and we pretty much follow the same protocol down here. Um, we're, we started a spreadsheet with, internally so that I can keep track of each code, who has it, who the counselor is, so that we can um, track that the right count, uh, code is with the right client. And it's been working well for us. I've been putting the codes in. And then as the applications are complete and ready to go is when um, I give our counselor the code that will be used to actually start the online application. Great. So here's a question for both of you. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. Um, how much time do you think you, you spend, or maybe the counselor uh, can tell us, how much time do you think you actually spend working up an application? I, it's very brief. I mean, I can get through the whole thing, doing the initial intake questions and uploading everything and submitting it probably 15 minutes max. So it's very quick. I agree. It's, it doesn't take much more than that once you have all your paperwork in place. So after we have a, a counseling session with the client, which is usually somewhere between one and a half to two hours, um, we usually have them sign all the documentation at the point that they're in the office. And then if there's anything missing, we let them know that their application will not be submitted until we have all of the required paperwork in our possession and then we'll start it. But the actual um, time that's spent inputting the application online from beginning to end, again, doesn't, it doesn't need to take more than 15, 20 minutes. And that's including scanning and uploading the documents. That is fantastic. Um, have you both been having a, a pretty easy time with the communication portal, with getting responses and sending? missing documents and things, things like that? It's been, oh, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just say for us initially when we were first putting in our first group of applications, we were so excited to hear back on what the status was of them. And it was just before the holidays that it felt like it was taking a little bit of time to know 
what was going on with their application. Unlike Cloud Loan Port or some other automated systems, you don't get like an automated message that says application received or you know it's been assigned or there's no um, time stamps as far as when to expect the next um, step in the process. But once the application is complete and has gone to underwriting, communication with the MAP team is, is really straightforward and, and we get responses to our questions and we try to um, respond to the underwriter's needs as quickly as possible. So once a loan's in progress and being reviewed and, and ready to go, it's, it's easy, but you're not going to hear much in, until your loan is, is in the pipeline and working on being approved. Right. I, I agree. I think since there's since it was, you know, we were the some of the test cases in the beginning, of course there were much fewer applications, so I think it moved more quickly only because the volume wasn't there. I noticed since we're in the in the two hundred loan range now that are being reviewed at some point, I think it slowed down a little bit. But the um, there's always a quick answer to your communication um, and if you know that you need to do a, a, a an email through your normal email system just to reach out to the, the uh, to whoever is reviewing the file I know we usually deal with Jackie or Shannon um, and just to let them know there's a note in the communication log can you tell me you know what when we're going to hear back you know they're very quick to respond it's just I think now that there's so uh, so much more volume in the in the program, it's slowed down a little bit, but um, not to the point where it's and there's any problem with the system. The system is very efficient. That is certainly good to hear from both of you. Um, I think we have a couple of questions right now. We do. Um Mark, and again, everyone, you are unmuted, so again, feel free to jump in and ask them um, over the phone. Um, like Margarita, if you're on and would like to ask your question, feel free to do so. Actually, it was Joan's question, and she just wants, we wanted to know, can you tell us how much uh, funds are still available? Are hey, we, so I'll, I'll take that one. Um, we, yeah. I, can't actually tell, I, can't, I can't actually tell you the dollar amount of money left. Um, but I can say that there's a significant amount left for each region. So, um, you know, if you have a client that you think is a worthwhile applicant, I say definitely work up an application. Okay. And you don't have to be too conservative. I'll put it that way. Okay. <laughs> Great. And then Michelle Basha, are you on? And would you like to ask your question? I am on. And uh, yes. I'm concerned about how to go. I haven't done one yet, and I've just gotten a few people who are likely candidates. Um, and I was speaking to an agent at Wells Fargo, and he didn't seem to think that they had to re provide any sort of documentation about accepting any proposal we had regarding using MAP funds toward a certain, a particular client. And my understanding was that we did need to provide something from the banks. So I just wondered if I could get some clarification on what exactly is being required and how, and some tips on how to get that information. Mary or Carol, do you guys want to talk about um, I, with that I, at all? I could speak to that. Um, the, in one, one case in particular, the client that um, we had a closed loan on, I didn't need anything other than the documentation from, it was a city loan and it was also a Sony May loan. And uh, the client was not eligible for modification. She had had a modification and um, became delinquent again. So what we needed to do was just uh, request that the, uh, we move forward to reinstate the existing modification. So we had the information from the mortgage statement that showed what the delinquency was. We estimated what it was going to be and thus used that for submission and requested the reinstatement uh, based on what we estimated it was going to be. And then CNYCN very quickly, once the, the, the uh, MAP loan was approved, CNYCN 
helped us get the uh, reinstatement letter like within a matter of hours from city and uh, the actual figures were there and that's all we needed but um, I did not know that that you would need anything more than either proof that they were declined a modification and then you were going to try and reinstate the loan. Um, there didn't, doesn't seem to be to me a lot of um, uh, lender or servicer participation in this other than either a denial letter or ultimately getting a reinstatement figure from the bank attorney or the bank directly. Okay. Uh, the case that I, I was um, sorry, this sorry. is Emily Wheeler um, from CNYCN. Um, if I could just speak to that point um, very briefly. Um, so we do actually have an escalation team here at CNYCN, and they're um, very very skilled at getting uh, workout letters, um, lenders, and servicers very quickly, as Carol um, as Carol just mentioned. Um, there is, a, there is an authorization form that counselors do need to fill out in order uh, for us to escalate your case uh, here. Um, that form is going to be um, available on the advocate portal um, very soon, but um, if you need it before then, before it shows up, just um, uh, you can ask Jack or myself for, for that form. Um, but they are, um, once, once you get a case that's approved, um, we can get those workout letters very, very quickly. Um, for you, so um, we encourage you to fill out that authorization form. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have questions right now? Uh, feel free to, to speak, you're unmuted, or you can type it either way. I was going to, Emily, I actually didn't see that you had got on here. I was going to oh, highlight sorry. that. The, the escalations program. Uh, if you guys are having trouble with banks getting, you know, letters or anything, feel free to reach out to, to my, the center or myself, and we can work on getting it into the escalations program. Because whereas it might take a couple weeks to solve the, those, uh, the center's program can solve that in a matter of days. Eight, nine, nine, seven. Uh, just one, uh, one, one thing, thing I, I did want to mention. Sorry, um, sorry this is Emily again. <laughs> Um, we, so I think Carol was discussing having done a closing in person, um, which we did do a few of those, Caitlin did a few of those at the beginning, um, uh, but all the closings now are being done remotely, they're being done um, uh, via, via conference, um, conference line, so um, you don't have to worry about you know, traveling or having to, your clients travel, um, it gets your own offices, but um, to make it a little easier on um, everyone. And one thing that I wanted to throw out there, we had been talking about uh, just asking the housing counselors, um, have any of you noticed a need for uh, a higher amount of money that we could lend? Uh, is $40,000 enough money or is it not enough money? Has anyone been noticing that it's not enough money in certain situations? And that's kind of a question for everyone, so feel free to type an answer or anything, or Carol or Mary, if you guys have anything on that. Uh, this is Mr. John, and we could always use uh, more from money. the housing council. I will have to say that we have a lot of people coming in here that are like five, six, and more years behind. So potentially, we could use more than forty thousand because sometimes with them being so far behind, there's not very many options available. We've had that a similar situation, but quite honestly, at the point um, that say you, if it was increased maybe to fifty thousand dollars, it could help in particular circumstances. But um, every one that we was a potential a potential for the MAP loan. Um, there's also uh, the fact that we're in such a high cost area and they had high mortgages to start with and if they're in $150,000 in arrears because of our real estate taxes being so high, it kind of is uh, self-defeating to 
put a homeowner into a, uh, a having an, another lien on the property that's going to already push an already max CLTV to beyond the realm of ever being repaid on, you know, being able to repay the loan. Because it's just because of virtually where we are. But there's always a, a different set of circumstances that could it could benefit a homeowner. Um, but it, it's so much on a case-by-case -case basis, like every client that you see is different. So it, it's really hard to judge whether increasing the amount of the loan would be really that beneficial. But maybe an exception process could be put in place for the ones that it did make sense on. Great. Thanks, Carol. Um, Emily, do you, we got a question um, about asking if we can request more than $40,000 in certain, certain circumstances and case by case. Do you want to answer that? Uh, we don't have any, um, any ability to go over no, $40,000 um, at this Hey, Jack, this is Maria. I spoke to some of the advocates yesterday, and as Carol mentioned, they're, they're, I think there might be a sweet spot that, you know, some, some increase um, is, w would probably be beneficial, and then it's, it's going to go to a, a, you know, a point of no return where, I mean, we can't increase it to 100,000, but that would probably solve a lot of issues down here in Long Island, but that's just not the realistic picture. But there may be a sweet spot that, you know, an increase might fill a, a niche. <clears throat> okay, great. Thanks, Maria. That's, that's helpful. Sure. Um, Emily, do you want to just give a really quick overview of the exception process? Because I think some people are a little bit confused about uh, what is eligible and what is not eligible for exceptions. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the one thing that, um, so we don't make exceptions for, um, for a few things. Um, we won't make an exception for AMI if, if someone is over the 120 percent. Um, unfortunately, we cannot make an exception for that. Um, we, um, under certain circumstances, um, we've had a lot of, quite a few um, denials uh, because homeowners are over our 40% um, front end uh, debt to income ratio. Um, so for that, um, you know, if, if the homeowner is able to show affordability going forward, and you know they're they're relatively close to that 40%, uh, it's possible that we can make an exception um, if there is in fact a case to be made there. It's never a guarantee, but um, but that is one scenario under which we would, would make an exception. Um, so um, as far as the process for, for exceptions, um, so as it's kind of been going now, the, the underwriters will review the case. Uh, if, if they see that it's a denial, they'll make a note of that uh, in the communication law. Um, you as advocates can, um, and, uh, and those cases would go and check out. We have a credit and policy committee, and, and final approval would be um, That would need uh, more than forty thousand. Should they should they go ahead and try to apply? Um, and so at this point, we don't have um, we don't have authorization from the OAG's office to go above forty thousand. That's the maximum that we can do at this point under any circumstance. There, you know, actually isn't any kind of exception that exists um, currently. Um, you know, if 
you know, that may be a conversation we have down the line, but um, currently, you know, there is no um, ability for us to go above the 40,000. We don't have authorization to. Oh, yeah. Mary, were you starting to ask a question? Yeah, we are hoping just for a little bit of clarification on, um, we, we understand and, and firmly support the fact that MAP is to be used for uh, homeowners with no additional options. We've come across a few homeowners that kind of started at the bottom of our list and where we've gotten enough codes and enough apps in that we're reconsidering a few homeowners that we feel are um, questionable. For example, we have a homeowner who was offered a modification but didn't make any payments on it. Now that modification is no longer, you know, on the table and out of options. So torn. She was offered a mod and chose or didn't wasn't able to make the modified payments. Now do we apply her for MAP? I mean that are those our kind of calls on our end or is that is, does the MAP program have a, a position on a situation like that? <laughs> It really is, I think, Mary, a call, a call you know, that, that's your judgment call. But um, if you think that really she's out of options, then, you know, I would definitely put her in the MAP program. And even if you start going for something else while she's going through the MAP program, you can always cancel your application with us if you find another alternative. Okay. Right. I, um, just to add to that, I think, um, you know, our main question when, when the underwriters are reviewing these cases is always, um, you know, what is, what is uh, the affordability uh, going forward for the homeowner? And so I think the question would be, you know, um, why was the homeowner not able to make um, the, the, uh, you know, the trial payment for the mod? Um, but certainly, um, you know, I, I think everyone should just continue to think of this program as uh, you know, a loan fund of last resort. and. Um, and we're just trying to emphasize that, but uh, you know, if you tried for the mod and haven't been able to get one, um, then that's one thing. But I think in this particular instance, um, the fact that they were offered one, but one is, I think there may be some questions about like why they weren't able to make the payment. Um, so you know, it's always it is a judgment call, as like Jack said. Um, uh, but but again, it goes back to it always goes back to that question of is there affordability going forward, and have they. Um, you know, tried for other uh, workout options. So the underwriters are yeah. looking at modification history and, and I guess, a success on previous plans. That is something that is considered during review. Uh, I mean, we're not, we're not um, you know, it's not a requirement for you to submit, you know, um, modification denial letters or anything like that. Um, but that said, you know, if we look at a case and, you know, it seems clear to us that, that a homeowner could, um, you know, um, might, may be eligible for a modification, then that's a question that we'll probably come back to you with. Um, so just okay. prepared for that. Yeah. Okay. And one thing I wanted to mention at this point was, uh, you know, as we continue to grow the program and figure out where it can go. Uh, we're constantly finding new things that we can do. Um, one thing that we've recently been talking about is working with uh, situations of imminent default in like a situation where someone has a shortage on their escrow. Um, if you have something like that, uh, we've now figured out that we can we can deal with something like that. So submit that and get in touch with us and let us know, you know what the situation is. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, Jack, one last point I did want to make for, for any um, anyone on the line that, does, that is a point person for your agency. Um, so we're, we're doing our best to try to um, uh, make it so that every agency has a, kind of like this rotating um, uh, 10 access codes. Um, and it's, you know, Kind of working like once you um, once you have a case that makes it to um, uh, the status of being under review, then that's when you would um, get a replacement access code. Uh, but I just want to let everyone know that that process isn't going to be instant. Um, there, I think um, Caitlin is right now handling that that process, and it's probably going to happen like once 
every week or so that we go back in and reissue those access codes. But um, you know, if you're running low, if you're starting to worry about that, just let us know and we'll um, make sure you have that, that 10 for your agency at all times. And um, Emily, we have a couple of questions that came in. I don't what? know if it's a good time to ask them. Let's try it. Sure. Sure. Um, Ames, feel free to expand on this, but they're wondering what is the smallest amount of funds that can be requested? Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no minimum. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Doc. No. That's the answer. There's no minimum. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then, again, Veronica, feel free to expand on this. You're unmuted, but um, if a homeowner has delinquent or high debt due to a divorce and was approved for a loan mod, can she apply for MAP funds to cover the debt? Am I unmuted? Can you, you hear are. me? You are. Oh, can hear you. <laughs> yep. All right. Yeah, so the homeowner has a, um, she acquired a lot of debt from her um, ex-husband. Yeah. And, but she has been approved for a modification. She's going to struggle to make the modification payments because the debt that she incurred, um, her husband no longer pays for because they're divorced now. So I was just wondering if that would be covered under MAP. It's not directly a low modification, you know, that you know she already got the modification, but could she uh, qualify for um, her debt? Emily, do you want to take that one? So I think, um, I'm not sure if I'm totally clear. Are um, you asking about, um, is it like consumer debt, like um, back end debt? Um, so there, there is, um, we do have a back end um, GPI ratio requirement, which is 55%. Um, so if, if the homeowner is above that 55 percent, they would not be um, eligible for MAP funding. Um, you know, if it's a, a, a circumstance like this one, then it's possible that they would um, be able to submit an exception. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if, that's, if um, that gets to the heart of your question. Veronica, I'm not sure if you lost connection, but um, you could just dial back in, please, and we'll be happy to re-answer your question or um, answer any follow-up questions that you have. I, like uh, if I could just chime, if I could chime in, I think that Veronica was asking if that homeowner's consumer debt could be covered. So, for instance, she's got other bills that aren't mortgage bills, but. It, they could, and she's got a mo She's recently gotten a modification, but these other non-mortgage debt type bills could potentially cause her a problem mm -hmm. with her ongoing mm -hmm. modification payment. I see. Um, so, unfortunately, we we can't um, we can't use MAP um, mm -hmm. funds for any type of debt that's not um, uh, either. Um, threatening foreclosure or somehow blocking the modification. Great. Any other questions? I do Anyone? have a question. All right. Hello. Hello. Yes, I do have a question. I have one client that recently called us um, concerning her mortgage, whereas her husband died three years ago and is now one behind on the mortgage, but two also behind on the taxes. Can that fund be used for back taxes? Uh, I can answer that. Um, yeah, we can. So with MAP, you can actually request uh, more than one usage type. Uh, so if in this case, it would it sounds like it would be to both reinstate the first mortgage, but also to pay off um, property tax arrears. So we can definitely do two mortgage types, um, so long as you know, the total is um, under the forty thousand. But also that um, you know, at, at, after you've received the MAP funding, that all of your housing debt um, has been brought current, um, either through um, 
you know, a combination of either through entirely through MAP funds or through a combination of MAP funds plus uh, a contribution from the homeowner if one, if one is needed or required. Thank you. I think, did, did we just get another question? Yeah. So, Veronica, do you want to expand on that? Can you speak? Hello? Can you hear me now? Okay, okay good. Oh, great. Um, so, same homeowner, I was just wondering if she could apply for the MAP funds um, to help pay some of the permanent loan modification payments up front to kind of get her back on her feet. Yes, she can use MAP funds for that, right, Emily? Um, so, loan mod. Um, that one's a little tricky. We, again, we would be evaluating the homeowner's um, ability to pay so, going forward. So I think the question there would be, um, you know, if it's a case where the, um, the homeowner can't afford the modification payment, um, well, we, we couldn't use the SNAP funds, um, the funds, like an unaffordable payment, but um, what we do do a lot is we do um, a lot of, uh, sometimes when the arrears are uh, too high, we'll do a down payment on, on the arrears to enable um, the money to go through. So that's a pretty, that's a common usage of SNAP. Um, okay. A, a, a mod down payment. Well, she's already completed the, the trial payment period, so would she still be eligible to uh, apply any uh, um, MAP funds for the delinquent balance, you know, a portion of the delinquent balance? Or um, should she? Has the modification been completed? Yes. Yes. All the trial payments, I think the trial payments ended last month, January. Hmm. So no, um, if, if the homeowner's already complete, if the mod's already been finalized, um, then and the payment's affordable going forward, then no, we wouldn't, um, you know, think we would be able to um, do like a retroactive Okay, so then that's off the table, so she could not apply for um, advanced payments of like for three months okay. to kind of help her get on her feet. Yeah, it's not that it, it's, she would struggle, not that it's unaffordable, but because of the debt that was left by her ex-husband, she's incurred all of that and the mortgage payment, which he used to pay, I don't know, maybe 20 years, and now it's all on her. So I was just trying to think of the best solution for her to help her through. Mm. Um, that's something I would maybe have to just double check with our um, program manager, but I, to my knowledge, we would not, um, uh, we would not, would not be able to um, help with that through map time. Um, yeah, I think as far as I know, the only thing we've done is the down payment to enable a modification. But I don't okay. know that we've ever actually done um, made the prior. All right, thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more question. That's all right. Um, and I, I just want to do a quick friendly reminder to everyone that um, everyone, for the most part, is unmuted unless you're self-muted. Um, so please keep in mind that we can hear any conversations going on in the background or any um, typing or any papers that you might be going through. So if you are doing that, um, please, we ask that you self-mute yourself and then unmute your, when you want to pipe in. Um, so thank you. Um, our next question, um, and Lisa, let me know if you want to expand on this, but um, they're wondering, once a MAP loan has been closed and funded, what are the next steps for the client and the counselor? Lisa, do you want to expand on that anymore, or just curious? Uh, no, we're just curious, yeah. 
so typically after you close and you're funded, um, it'll take about a, a couple weeks um, or up to two weeks, and the check will be sent from uh, sustainable neighborhoods to the debtor. Um, and then you'll get your, um, I think, Emily, you, you get, you'll get a letter of completion, right? Uh, so, actually, so once you're approved for the loan, um, uh, so at that point, Caitlin Valley in our office um, would be working with the with you as the advocate um, to do the closing. Um, so first, we would need um, a notice of approval will be drawn up um, that just kind of details the terms of the loan, and then um, uh, the homeowner would have to sign that and return that to us. Um, then we would need to receive um, uh, a workout letter um, from the lender that just um, you know, should should have a few things. Should have the total payoff of, or payoff or reinstatement amount, um, and should tell us where to send the funds. Um, and then it should have a good through date um, that is good for at least um, kind of judgment call there. But usually for at least another week or two. Um, but the closings have been happening, and then the, so then Caitlin will schedule. Um, Caitlin will upload all the loan docs through Counselor Direct. Um, and then the, um, in your individual offices, you'll actually have to um, print the loan docs um, and then uh, schedule a phone um, closing, which Caitlin will be on, and she'll explain the loan terms. Um, and the homeowner will be there as well. Um, they'll explain the loan terms. Um, and um, then they'll, the homeowner will sign the loan docs, and then uh, those will get FedEx back to us here at CMYPN, um, and that's it. And then, um, then yeah, so then Caitlin uh, will get the check and send that to the um, to Okay, uh, okay so just, just to elaborate on that a little bit, once all of that is done and uh -huh. the check has already been sent to the bank, uh -huh. is there any additional uh, follow-up or work that needs to be done on behalf of the counselor? Will they receive a letter through the portal indicating that the check has been sent and uh, like a kind of like a closeout letter that we can confirm with the client that they received? Uh, that's a good question. I think so. Um, I believe um, I'll have to double check with Caitlin, but I believe, and we can follow up with you on this, but I believe, um, yeah, that Caitlin gets like a letter of satisfaction or um, uh, the, yeah, sorry, the payoff letters I should also mention also need to have um, just like kind of like standard language, um, you know, about um, if there's a foreclosure action, uh, that the payoff amount will um, stop the foreclosure action, um, or if it's like a reinstatement, that that amount will um, fully like reinstate the loan. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. And just to add one more thing on that, Lisa. Uh, the homeowner does get, you know, a copy of the mortgage or uh, the original of the mortgage and a copy of the note, so that they do have that, you know, signed and dated with all when it happened. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jack. So great. Any any more questions? If you don't have any questions. Um, you can jump over to a little um, tech training on the website if anyone has any specific questions about, you know, the communication portal or the actual steps through or the um, advocate proposal, anything like that. If anyone feels comfortable on the website, feel free to drop off the call. Thank you very much for talking with us. Um, we'll stay on for a little tech help for the next 15 minutes or so if anyone needs it. And as always, be in touch. With me, if you need anything, um, like I said, the center has a great escalations program, and thank you very much for uh, attending the phone call. Thank you. So we'll hang out here for just a minute, see who drops off, and then we can kind of jump over to the website. Ah? 
Okay, so it looks like we have quite a few people that stayed on. So I am going to assume that we have a bunch of questions about the website. So does anyone want to start, or should I just start at the beginning and walk through? Walk me through it. I'm okay with the walkthrough. Yeah, just, just go ahead and walk through it, okay? All right, we can, we can do that. Give me one second to get my screen in order here. So I'm sure those of you have, who have worked on the applications are familiar with the portal here. Um, this, these seven steps. The um, the homeowner side of it. So we'll start, you know, with the very simple here. Step one: property information. And guys, feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. Uh, Emily and I can kind of help out uh, with some one-on-one -on -one info here. Um, anyway, first step here: very basic information. This is your uh, property information for the applicant that you fill out. Um, go to the next here. We have homeowner information. This is a little more detailed about the actual applicant. This is, of course, all test information, so don't go and try and use that social sort of security number. It's fake. Um, you fill all this out. However many household members that you're adding, you can just click here, keep adding. You, know, you can go up to as many as you need. Um, and make sure that you're vigilant with, with this, with your total household size. Once you actually click your total household size, you can't change it, so make sure that you get that click right on the first one. Um, and if you do have a problem with that, get in touch with me and we can kind of figure out how to solve that. We've had a couple issues with that in the past. Um, so once you get your homeowner information all put in, we'll go to the next step, which is hardship information. Uh, you'll just mention why they fell behind. And it can be as simple an explanation once you, you know, click the category as I fell behind. Or you can get more detailed and give everyone a little bit more information on why. Um, and of course, you as the advocate, when you do the advocate proposal, can type more information to give them yeah. that insight as well. Sure. Uh, so, uh, can we? Is there any way we can upload? Like, if we've got somebody who's got a hardship letter already done, could we just upload that into that? Absolutely. Uh, and you, you know, you could write right here just C hardship letter, or just give a very brief ah. summary. But yeah, you, okay. you could upload that into the the, the document portal. Definitely. Thank you. And you know, of course, the more information you give, the easier the process is. So great. So this is the hardship. Next, we'll go to the income, which this is this is also you know very important. Find their employment income. Try and be as up to date as possible. Does anyone have any questions about this page? I know this is where the application gets starts to get a little bit in depth. You fill out their other income and their assets. If they have income coming from within the home, you'll need um, two months of statements. If you have income coming from outside of the home, you'll need six. And if you have rent, rental income, it needs to be three months of statements for all those so that we know, you know there's not a flight risk um, giving money to the applicant. All right, if there's no questions, I'll move to the next, next one here. The next one is actually the the information on your housing debt. You can go in there and kind of find, let us know what's actually going on. Uh, this is a, another you know very important part of the application. Pretty straightforward. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so on to the financial worksheet, which is where you'll enter all the very important information about your applicant. Um, you'll fill out your income sources here, which you mentioned earlier in the income and accounts page. And once you fill out this page with all their, their debts, their um, income expenses, and all of that, you will get at the bottom here uh, a summary. And the website does the math for you, so you don't actually, I hope that you've done the math beforehand. But if you haven't, uh, the website will tell you, you know, where they are on front end DTI, if they're below the median income, the AMI they need to be over, they're over it, and if they do have a surplus, and you need to have at least a zero dollar surplus from that. So this is a page that a lot of people have a little bit of a problem with, so are there any questions on this? 
Uh, anyone feel free to let me know if I'm moving too quickly. Hey, Jack, I have a quick question. Sure. Related, related to this form here, um, do, you, do you foresee you guys maybe doing something like this more towards the front end when we're doing an assessment of a client for eligibility? Um, where we could input this information and, and you know, it, was doing, it would be doing the math for us. And, uh, and then hypothetically, let's just say it did work, then maybe we could then uh, transmit it over to this form, import it, import it into this form. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, that, that's a great idea. I don't know if we have anything like that in the works. Um, Emily, do you want to speak about that at all? Uh, sure. So um, I, I don't know about creating any kind of like um, form that will do the calculations for you ahead of time, but we are working on um, uh, getting a paper application out to everyone very soon. Um, so, uh, so we will have a budget sheet that will at least allow you to um, um, like do these calculations ahead of time before like. Um, before signing on and having to do it all here online, um, but that that's a good idea to um, have something that would also do the calculations for you. So maybe we'll um, give that some thought. Um, one thing I did want to mention also on this budget page, um, Jack, could you scroll up to the housing debt section? Yes. So and also, Conan, um, just an FYI, Conan. You know there is that very very basic. Um, check uh, if you just go to nysmap.org. It's not very thorough, but it's not a bad pre-screen. Yeah, we've been, I've been using that, and, and it is good. I mean, it, it's actually helped us out quite a bit. Um, but I, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that um, I've been looking, and I was going to develop myself in like an Excel spreadsheet, something like this, that I could make sure that, that they meet the requirements from a, you know, from the, uh, uh, that's the income standpoint. They meet the 40% requirement and all that. And to see this is like, wait a second, there it is. You know, I, we could use this instead. Mm -hmm. That's all. <laughs> uh, so the, the thing I wanted to point out in the housing debt section, you do see uh, two columns here. Um, the first one is for your um, for the current um, housing payment, and then the second one should reflect what the housing payment will be um, after receiving MAP funds. So this is kind of like your estimate. Um, you know, if you're applying to pay off, um, if you're applying to, um, sorry, to like reinstate your first mortgage, for instance, then your payment, um, as you can see here, your payment both, um, currently and then after MAP would still be the same. Um, if you were applying to, say, pay off a second mortgage, like do a short payoff or something like that, um, you would see a payment in that first column, but not anything in the second column. And we, we calculate um, our um, DPI numbers are based on that post um, map intervention column, just so everyone is aware of that. Um, and then also in the top section, the income section here, um, it's your gross income that's being carried over from that previous um, step four. Uh, what you're doing is, as advocates, you're calculating the, the monthly net income um, and then inputting that monthly net income for each income type, each income source. Uh, so if you need, um, there are websites, there are um, some sources that you can go to for help with calculating net income because um, that's something that I know a lot of homeowners will have um, trouble with. But um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, Blanca, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I, be, just because I am working on putting together an application for a homeowner who just received a trial mod today to start March 1st, but he has two liens to take care of, so I thought, uh, and based on his income and everything else, I think he would be a good candidate for this. Um, having said that, in the housing debt section on the screen that you have on, would I then write what his monthly amount current before the mod, or would I write what the mod offer is under monthly amount after New York State MAP intervention? Do you understand? 
Yeah, so I think you could just write, um, so again, the calculation will always be based on the after math and intervention, and that's what we really care about. So I would just write the trial payment um, under mortgage one, and then generally the trial, if it's like HAMP, the, tri the trial generally includes its escrow, so, um, so then you're like, you wouldn't have anything for property taxes or homeowners. Um, but yeah, as far as the current payment, um, you could go either way. I would probably just put, um, I guess I would just put the trial payment if they've already started it. They will in March. Oh, okay. Um, so then you could just put, it, yeah, it's kind of just, you know, whatever judgment call there, but um, you could put the current payment. That would, that would actually maybe strengthen the case a little bit if you could show that the um, payment going forward is, um, you could show the affordability from the current payment compared to the trial payment. I have a question. Okay. So I'm sorry. So just so then the trial payment is actually right under Schedule under current. Uh, no, the trial payment you'd write under the after intervention. Got it. Okay. Just wanted. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Yes, I have a question. Uh, yeah, John Sanders from Metro Interfaith. Uh, my question is uh, if the last conversation is dealing with a trial payment and we can use the trial payment calculations for the MAP program, the homeowner doesn't necessarily have to be denied by the lender uh, after a loan review, correct? No, uh, sorry, so I, I think I missed the beginning of that, but um, the, the, so we don't actually require um, uh, like, you know, proof of uh, modification denial. It's just that we, um, you know, for all scenarios, we're um, wanting everyone to know that this should be thought of as a, a loan fund of uh, last resort and that, um, you know, again, if there's a an option to do a repayment plan, if there's an option to get a modification, an affordable modification, then um, by all means um, be sure that you're applying for the, you know, for those things for your clients and um, don't use MAP for those for those reasons, but um, MAP should be used, you know, again, as a last resort. Okay, because that uh, basically clarifies uh, what I was thinking, because uh, what I was thinking regarding MAP uh, is to, if you have a uh, package that's in loss mitigation with a lender, and the lender's in a loan review with that package, and it hasn't a workout process or workout solution yet, that uh, the counselor would have to wait until that solution comes back to the office, whether it's an acceptance or denial, in order to determine whether the homeowner uh, should apply for MAP. Right. Um, so, Right, and that's kind of a challenge. We've had sometimes, like, you know, obviously these things are kind of um, happening simultaneously. Uh, so um, it's okay to start applying for MAP, um, you know, at the same time that you've applied for a modification, but just, um, you know, be aware that if you do receive the modification, it's, affordable, it's an affordable payment going forward, then um, you would not be able to use MAP funds um, in that case. We would, the, so we would can't we'd end up canceling the the application uh, once we got a modification uh, agreement. Right, we'd uh, withdraw the application now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. I know we're. Oh, oh yep. Oh, go ahead. I think we're going to say the same thing. So go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I know we're a little bit over time, but um, does anyone want me to go through the, um, the action communication log? Does, does everyone feel comfortable with that, or we can pop through it really quickly? Yeah, can you do that, Jack? Sure, yeah. If anyone has to go, feel free to drop off. We'll just, we'll just keep going here. So here's the communication log. I know a lot of people are having a little issues, little issues with it, and it's not totally all on the advocate end. Um, you know, so whenever you're making an update to the to your application here, you're uploading files here. Um, you want to go to your 
communication log here. Sorry, my words are failing me. And just leave a comment. Um, and whoever's email is down here, there will be either someone from the center or the underwriters or your email as the advocate. Uh, whenever you save this comment, it will get sent to anyone whose email is down there. So whoever you want to see these comments that are going back and forth, you can add them to that. Um, this is your hub of information for everything going on with your MAP application. So you know when you need to see an update, come here first and make sure that something hasn't happened that you didn't see. Usually, you know if you get a property report ordered or something like that, it will just populate in here. Um, so make sure you check there before you uh, worry or anything like that, because hopefully all your information will be here. Um, are there any specific questions about the about the communication log? I know we've had some hangups. All right, great. Um, well, in the carrying about time, I'll go over the advocate proposal here just really quickly, uh, which I, I think you all are pretty familiar with because everyone has been getting through these pretty well. Um, you know, this is kind of where you make your case for your client. So you, you come in here, fill out all the basic information, um, and really the important part is the is this advocate notes. Uh, if you feel that you need to explain something more and give us a little background on the case, you know, type as much as you need to here, give us everything you think is relevant and why this is a good case and that can only help us. Like I said earlier, the more information that you help, that you give us, the easier it is for us to get through everything. So um, any questions about this? That makes sense. All right, great. Well, hey, thank you everyone for, for being on the call. Carol and Mary, thank you very much for uh, sharing your experiences. We appreciate it. Uh, as always, be in touch with us if you need anything. Give me a call. Um, give the center a call if you need anything. And we, uh, we appreciate you growing in this program with us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thanks, day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now.